My name is Daniel Greco, and I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at Yale University. Today's video will concern a topic in epistemology, which is the branch of philosophy that deals with the study of knowledge. In particular, I'll discuss a version of skepticism, which is the idea that we know a lot less than we ordinarily take ourselves to. The sort of skepticism I'll discuss is due to David Hume, who is an 18th century Scottish philosopher and historian. And it targets our knowledge of the unobserved. So to get clearer about just what that amounts to, we'll have to start with some examples. So we ordinarily take ourselves to know lots about things that we haven't directly observed. For instance, I take it that I know that blue whales are the largest animals on Earth. I bet you know that too. I take it I know that the Alpha Centauri system is the nearest star system to our own. I take it I know that there was a man named Napoleon who conquered much of Europe. I also take it I know when the next American presidential election will be. None of these are things that I've directly observed. I haven't seen any blue whales. Certainly haven't seen all other animals on Earth to compare them to. I never met Napoleon, and I haven't observed anything in 2016 yet. And yet, I, and I take it you, ordinarily take myself to know all sorts of things about these matters. So how do we know these things about stuff that we haven't yet observed? In some cases, it seems pretty easy. For instance, I know that all triangles, even triangles I haven't yet observed, have three sides. Or I know that next year, if I have two apples and two oranges, I'll have four pieces of fruit. What's special about these cases that makes them so easy to know? The way that Hume put it, they express relations of ideas. A relation of ideas is something whose denial is inconceivable or self-contradictory. Try to imagine a two-sided triangle. Take it, you can't do it. Or try to imagine a situation where I have two apples and two oranges, nothing else, but where I don't have four pieces of fruit. Again, I suspect you're going to have trouble. Here's another way of getting at the same idea. Relations of ideas have to be true, no matter how the world turns out. They're necessary truths. So what does it take to know claims like this? What does it take to know relations of ideas? To quote Hume, he said that propositions of this kind are discoverable by the mere operation of thought without dependence on what is anywhere existent in the universe. Hey, what does that mean? Why does he think it's true? I take it the idea is something like this. If some claim is a relation of ideas, then it will be true no matter what the world is like. So in order to know that it's true, we don't need to go out and gather evidence about what the world is like. The evidence might tell us the world is this way rather than that way, but no matter what way the world is like, all triangles will have three sides. Two pieces of fruit and another two pieces of fruit will make four pieces of fruit. So if anything at all is required to know that a relation of ideas is true, it's just understanding it. This is what Hume called the mere operation of thought. That's enough to see that it has to be true, and so to know that it's true. Okay, contrast relations of ideas with another class of claims that Hume called matters of fact. So for example, as I now make this video, it's rainy outside. Or here's another one. I have a fluffy puppy. So these claims are true, both of them, but their denials are not inconceivable or contradictory. The mere operation of thought isn't enough to get us knowledge of their truth. You could easily imagine that it's sunny outside. In fact, maybe as you listen to this video, it is. Or you could imagine that I have no pets at all, including no fluffy puppy, even though in fact I do. So because these claims have denials that aren't contradictory, because you can conceive that they're false, it's not enough to just understand what they mean to see that they're true. You have to go out and make some observations, see that the world is one way rather than another way. So these matters of fact contrast with relations of ideas and what it takes to know them. This distinction that Hume is getting at between relations of ideas and matters of fact is closely related to what was later called the distinction between the a priori and the a posteriori by Immanuel Kant. Hi, my name is Daniel Greco. I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at Yale University. Previously, I discussed David Hume's distinction between relations of ideas and matters of fact. Today, I'd like to discuss how that distinction gets applied by Hume to offer a skeptical argument concerning induction. So how can we come to know about matters of fact? A natural thought is that observation will tell us about matters of fact. 
You know that it's sunny because you can go outside and look. Hume is willing to grant, at least for the sake of argument, that observation is a way of knowing about matters of fact. But remember, we started with some examples concerning matters of fact that we haven't yet observed. Remember, concerning what will happen in the future, say when the next American presidential election will be, or concerning what animals are like that I at least have never directly observed. So how can we know about these matters of fact, if not by observation, and also not by the mere operation of thought? Here's a general strategy that Hume thinks we often use. We project observed regularities, things that have been true in those cases that we have observed, onto unobserved cases. So for example, all the fires I've observed have been hot. Whenever I've been exposed to a fire, and have gotten a chance to, say, put my hands near it, it's been hot. So I assume the fires that I haven't observed will be hot too. More generally, we start with some premise that says all observed Fs have been G, where F might be fire and G might be heat, but it could be something else too. And we draw the conclusion that all unobserved Fs are Gs too. We'll call this pattern of inference induction. I think we've got a bit too quick. This can't be quite right. We don't always use induction. For instance, here's an example of induction as I've described it. Every hair of mine that I've observed is black. So in the future, all my hairs will continue to be black. Now, I would love it if this were a good persuasive argument, but it's not, given what's held true for my parents and my aunts and uncles and my grandparents and humanity as a whole. I have excellent reason to think that at some point in the future, some of my hairs will be gray. But even if it were true that every hair of mine that I've observed is black, still that wouldn't give me reason to think that in the future, all of my hairs will continue to be black. So we don't always think that inductive arguments, arguments that use induction, are good ones. I think it would be too quick to dismiss induction as an interesting and important sort of argument on the basis of examples like the one involving my hair. I think we do often rely on something like induction, at least when we're making inferences about very general features of our environment. So in the case of fires being hot, or say in the case of gravity continuing to operate, say the sun rising tomorrow as it's risen every day in the past, we do take the inductive arguments to be good ones. So Hume thinks, and I'm inclined to agree, that we're implicitly assuming when we make arguments like this, something like what's been called the uniformity of nature. We're implicitly assuming that the future will resemble the past, at least in its most general respects. Maybe the future won't resemble the past in the respect of my continuing to have black hairs, but it will resemble the past in respect of fire continuing to be hot. That's more general. It will resemble the past in that people will continue to die, people will be mortal, and in that gravity will continue to operate. All these very general respects in which the future might resemble the past are ways that we think it will. These are cases where we think inductive arguments are good. You might think we don't need to use induction to come to views about what's going to happen in unobserved cases, because we can appeal to laws of nature. We can appeal to science, which tells us what the laws of nature are, and can let us make predictions about what's going to happen in cases that we haven't yet observed. But Hume thought, and I'm inclined to agree, that really appealing to laws of nature, like, say, the law of gravity, is just a matter of appealing to inductive arguments. When we appeal to laws of nature, we are at least implicitly assuming that these most general regularities that have held before will continue to hold. When we say that the Earth will continue to revolve around the Sun because gravity says it must, we're implicitly assuming that this regularity that's held in the past concerning how massive bodies interact will continue to hold in the future. That is, we're implicitly assuming that the uniformity of nature, that the future will resemble the past, will continue to hold. Why should we believe that? Why should we believe that the future will resemble the past, even in its most general respects? It's not a relation of ideas. It's conceivable that the future should fail to resemble the past, even in its most general respects. Try to imagine that tomorrow the sun doesn't rise, that gravity stops operating. Try to imagine that if you stick your hand into a fire tomorrow, it won't burn, but will instead be cold. This is the stuff of science fiction, but it is imaginable. There's no incoherence in supposing that while some law of nature has held true in all our observation in the past, it will fail to hold true in the future. I imagine you could write some good stories, consistent stories, stories that make sense, premised on the idea that, say, gravity or the laws of chemistry that have been true in the past might fail to be true in the future. So the mere operation of thought isn't going to be enough to convince us that the uniformity of nature holds. The mere operation of thought uncovering contradictions using logic, 
That's not going to show us that the future must be like the past. Here's another way that we might try and argue that the future will be like the past. We might try to use induction. After all, we saw that when we're dealing with matters of fact, we generally can't use the mere operation of thought. And when we're dealing with matters of fact that we can't directly observe, we need to use induction. So maybe, in arguing that the uniformity of nature will continue to hold, we can use induction. What might that look like? Here's an argument, an inductive argument. In the past, the future has resembled the past. So, in the future, the future will resemble the past. This looks to be circular. It assumes that because something happened in the past, it will continue in the future. It would only be a good form of argument if we already thought that the future would resemble the past. Otherwise, the mere fact that something has happened in the past wouldn't be something that we took to suggest at all that in the future, the future will resemble the past. How bad is this? How much should it worry us? I find it worrying. We ordinarily think that relying on induction is a good way to form beliefs about the future. It's a good way to form beliefs about what will happen in unobserved cases. In particular, it's a better way than other methods that we might use. Say, tea leaf reading, or astrology, or consulting a magic eight ball. So suppose I'm wondering whether I can fly. I'd really like to fly, and I'm considering jumping out of a 10th story window in the hopes that I'll be able to fly when I do. Will that succeed? Will I fly or will I die? If we trust induction, induction says I'll die. When things get thrown out of 10th story windows, they fall. At least when people do. But suppose I take my magic eight ball, shake it up, ask it whether I can fly, and it says, without a doubt. I think most of us would think, I should rely on the prediction that induction gives me, rather than the prediction that the magic eight ball gives me. Why should I do that? What's better about induction? We've already shown that we can give a circular argument in favor of induction. But we can do the same thing with the magic eight ball. Suppose I ask the magic eight ball, will you tell me the truth? Are you a good way for me to form beliefs about the future? I shake it up, and it says, without a doubt. So when I ask the magic eight ball whether it always tells the truth, it says that it does. When I ask induction whether induction will give me reliable beliefs about the future, it says that it does too. In both cases, I can give a circular question-begging argument. I can assume that some method is a reliable way of forming beliefs about the unobserved. And then using that method, the method will say, good job, stick with me. But that doesn't distinguish between induction and trusting the magic eight ball. So do we have any reason to think that induction will lead to true beliefs and trusting the magic eight ball won't? Here's one interpretation of what Hume said, Hume's skeptical solution to the problem of induction. There's no rationally compelling reason to use induction rather than crystal ball gazing or astrology or relying on a magic eight ball. Still, we just can't help but reason inductively. It's a strong habit, much like birds can't resist flying south in the winter. It's not rational, it's just something we do out of instinct. And because this instinct is so strong, the question of justifying induction doesn't really arise, at least not in practice. We'll keep using it whatever philosophical conclusions we come to. So we can set this question aside, recognizing that we're behaving irrationally, but that we're just not able to bring ourselves to behave rationally. Now, I can't quite bring myself to accept this position. And I'm also skeptical that it's really the right interpretation of Hume. But it's very hard to say what's wrong with our Hume-inspired argument. And lots of subtle and interesting philosophy has been done that attempts to do just that. If you're intrigued, that's a topic for another video.